Tonight, the United Nations aid agency, described as the backbone of Gaza, now under investigation. 12 of its staff accused of taking part in the October the 7th attacks. The Israeli government wants to shut it down, but who will help the Palestinian people if that happens? The man who leads UNRWA's operations in the Strip told me some employees have betrayed their mission and their people. That's after several countries paused millions in funding, meaning the Strip faces what's described as inevitable famine. They've betrayed the, uh, the Palestinians themselves and have compromised uh, this vital, vital aid operation. For the one million people now sheltering in Rafa, the fear that tanks and bombs are now heading south. But that leaves nowhere else to hide. This evening, more about that damning dossier and a direct appeal to countries to reinstate financial support. Also on the program, one year after the Turkey-Syria earthquake, tens of thousands are still living in tents. An anger too at the handling of the aftermath of the quakes, which left 55,000 people dead. And the Oscar-winning director Steve McQueen on his new film and why we need less talk, more solutions after October the 7th. There's so much noise on this subject matter. I think it's, I think for that noise to shut up and to sort of just to get the situation where people can actually help to solve the situation. Good evening. Welcome to the world with me, Yalda Hakim. We begin tonight with the uncertainty around the fate of the aid agency once described as the backbone of Gaza. Since the war in Gaza began, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees has helped feed more than 2 million people under siege. But in the past 10 days, it's lost millions in funding and much of its credibility. That's after allegations from Israel that 12 of its employees had taken part in the October the 7th attacks. The evidence has not been made public, which is why countries like the US and the UK, who have paused financial aid, have been accused of collective punishment. Some agencies say a famine inside Gaza is now inevitable. And that's likely made worse if the families of Israelis still held captive continue to block trucks carrying much needed supplies. And even for those who are safe for now in the south, there are concerns the Israeli military will soon carry out operations inside Rafah. So much to discuss tonight, but let's get started with the future of the UN agency, which has been a lifeline for so many. UNRWA is the biggest relief agency in Gaza. It employs 13,000 people and 2.3 million Palestinians rely on it for day-to-day -day assistance. Providing food, shelter and education all fall under its remit. UNRWA's work has come at a huge human cost. More than 150 employees have been killed during Israel's military operation. Before this year, the top donors to UNRWA were the United States and Germany. But last month, they, along with the UK, abruptly paused funding. It followed Israel's six-page dossier that claimed 12 UNRWA employees were involved in the October the 7th attacks. Further claims said that 10% of UNRWA employees were operatives of Hamas or Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Following the accusations, the UN condemned the abhorrent alleged acts and sacked nine of the 12 accused workers, while two were reported to have died. Gaza, in its darkest hour, could be losing its biggest supporter. So what happens then? Well, a little earlier, I tried to get an answer to that question from UNRWA's Director of Affairs in Gaza, Tom White, who admitted recent allegations and events have rocked the organisation. Have a listen. Yes, I was shocked. Um, you know, we are very clear with our staff, and in fact, it's in the contract that they sign with UNRWA, uh, you know, that they work as humanitarians and any sort of militant activity is totally incompatible with their work. And that's the same for humanitarians around the world. So, yes, I was shocked, and I've spoken to a large number of our staff in the last few days, uh, Palestinian staff, and equally, they are shocked by the actions of this small, group uh, and, you know, essentially they've betrayed the organisation and they've betrayed their mission as humanitarians and, in fact, you know, they've betrayed the, uh, the Palestinians themselves and have compromised uh, this vital, vital aid operation. Uh, Tony Blinken, the US Secretary of State, have said that the US hasn't done its own investigation, but Israel's claims, uh, he's called Israel's claims highly, highly credible. How do you respond to that? Look, I think it's too early to tell. I think 
what's most important now is that we uh, support the investigation that has been launched by the United Nations. And once we've got the, uh, the findings of that investigation, and I must say this investigation is commissioned by the Secretary General and he has set some very clear expectations for this investigation, we will look at the, uh, the findings of the investigation uh, and take whatever action is required. I'm just going to have you listen to Prime Minister Netanyahu and, and what he's actually said uh, in terms of um, the, the links of the staff members uh, uh, to October 7. Uh, let's just play that clip. UNRWA is totally infiltrated with Hamas. It has been in the service of Hamas and its schools and in many other things. I say this with great regret because we hope that there would be uh, an objective and constructive body to offer aid. We need such a, uh, a body today in uh, Gaza. The UNRWA is not that body. It has to be replaced. I just want you, uh, Tom, to, to react there to what uh, the Prime Minister is saying. So I'd make a couple of comments. One is that this issue is becoming highly politicised in the context of this conflict. Uh, we are a UN organisation. We're committed to our humanitarian work uh, and we go to extraordinary measures to ensure that our staff act within what we call humanitarian principles, one of them being this issue of neutrality. The second thing I would say is we're very transparent with the Israeli authorities and we, we have been for decades uh, in terms of the work that we do. We coordinate very closely with the Israeli army on an ongoing basis. Uh, for the work that we do here in Gaza. Uh, and finally, I would say we provide the Israeli authorities every year a list of all of our staff members, all 13,000 staff members who are working uh, in uh, Gaza. So we are very clear about what we are doing to ensure that we but, operate Tom, in I, accordance ask, with humanitarian uh, principles. Tom, can I just ask, when was the last time you shared uh, the material and information uh, about the uh, members of staff with the Israeli authorities? Uh, our staff lists are provided to the Israeli authorities every 12 months. And have they come back with any concerns about any members of the 13,000 people you have working for you? We provide it on a regular basis every 12 months and we have not had any concerns raised by the Israeli authorities. Part of these astonishing accusations against your organisation is that roughly 10% of UNRWA staff were affiliated with Hamas or other militant factions. Um, you know, and, and Israel is saying this is obviously a UN agency supposed to be neutral of any political groups, let alone armed groups. So... We have... This has not been released to us. Uh, this is what we are seeing in the media, like everybody else. Uh, they are unsubstantiated allegations. Uh, and, you know, if we are provided information, we will take exactly the same action, which is to investigate it uh, and, if required, take action against any individual that has compromised uh, or betrayed the organisation. I um, am going to uh, just reference um, some tweets you put out in the last day or so uh, of these lorries. Um, could you just explain to us, they're, they're aid lorries, um, but, but what ac actually has happened to them? So the incident you're referring to occurred uh, yesterday. Uh, an aid convoy was waiting on the coastal road uh, to get final green light from the Israeli army. And I know, once again, you know, we are coordinating literally on an hourly basis at times with the Israeli army for an aid convoy to move into the north of Gaza. The Israeli uh, army have acknowledged that it was their fire, but it just highlights the risks to humanitarians in Gaza right now. Um, following these accusations, um, a number of countries, including the United States here in Britain, um, have halted their funding to UNRWA. Just give us a sense of where that leaves you where does that leave UNRWA, the staff and the work that you're trying to do? So it leaves us in a very precarious position, uh, and not just UNRWA, but the whole aid operation. You know, and I, I quote the Secretary General of the United Nations, who describes UNRWA as the backbone of the operation in Gaza. Uh, if we run out of funds, the aid operation here will collapse, and that'll be absolutely catastrophic for the, for the people of Gaza. 
Uh, you know, just to give you a sense, in the last couple of months, you know, we've provided 1.9 million uh, health consultations. Just on 20 million, do- uh, 20 million litres of water have been provided. We're feeding 350,000 families. But also, you know, we're working with partners, uh, NGOs and also other in- uh, UN agencies. Now, for example, you know, UNICEF is bringing vaccines into Gaza but those vaccines are being put in the arms of children by UNRWA nurses. And so it would be absolutely catastrophic if we run out of funds. Now, at this stage, the risk is uh, that we will not be able to pay the staff here who are risking their lives every day to serve the community here. We risk not being able to pay their salaries at the end of February. So, So is your future then, do you think, in doubt? Look, I remain hopeful. You know, we have taken some very decisive steps to address this issue. Uh, it, and I remind everybody that is a very small uh, minority of our staff uh, and we'll continue to work with our funding partners to give them the assurances uh, that they can, uh, with confidence, fund UNRWA uh, and ensure that through their contributions, the aid operation here doesn't collapse and we ensure that we avert, for example, a famine here in Gaza. And and just, you know, finally, do you feel these accusations have tainted the reputation of UNRWA? I'll speak from my, my sense. I'm, I'm exceptionally proud to work with the 13,000 staff of UNRWA. That was before the war, as they were educating children, as they were providing health care. But their efforts since the war has started has been absolutely extraordinary. Uh, many of them are displaced themselves. They're living in tents. Uh, they continue to, to roll up at work every day uh, and deliver aid in, a, in really trying conditions. So, uh, you know, I have hope that confidence will be restored in UNRWA uh, and my commitment uh, to our staff but also to the people of Gaza is we have to keep this operation going uh, because the consequences of it collapsing are really just unthinkable. And just very briefly, what message do you have to the uh, to the UK government? Because, of course, they uh, are a part of a number of countries that, that have halted the fund funding. My message to the UK government is um, work with us, uh, review the steps that we're taking right now, uh, and I really hope uh, that they come back to the table as a, a very important funding partner of UNRWA to ensure that we can continue to... Uh, meet the needs of people here in Gaza. That was UNRWA's Director of Affairs in Gaza, Tom White, speaking to me a little earlier. Well, let's speak now to our Middle East correspondent, Alistair Bunkel, who joins us live from Jerusalem. And Alistair, we're listening there to Tom White laying out the dire situation in Gaza at a time when, of course, the future of UNRWA itself is, is uncertain. Yeah, it is. Um, UNRWA and Israel have had a very troubled history that predates this war. But Israel believes it has evidence to show that employees of UNRWA were directly involved in the October the 7th attacks and were also supportive of those attacks. And so has made that allegation and made that case to a number of foreign governments, including the British government and the American government. And as a result, multiple nations around the world have suspended their funding for UNRWA. Now, I've, I've seen the documents uh, sent to me that contain those allegations. I have to say, they are, I mean, on, on the one hand, they're compelling allegations. On the other hand, there is very little evidence, like concrete evidence, that backs up Israel's claims. So it is possible that Israel has sent further evidence to to these foreign governments. But I think what is not in doubt is whether UNRWA is there or will be there in the future. There needs to be some sort of United Nations or some sort of major humanitarian organisation that is responsible for the like you know, the, the, the societal things that UNRWA has been looking after, schools, medical care, for example. Because were UNRWA not there, then Gaza would be in a far worse state than it is now. And I think, as Tom White said in that interview, it is at least alleged that the number of people involved in the attacks 
was very, very small, and UNRWA, as a larger body, is being punished for that. Ali, um, the US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, he's back in the region and the discussion is again around the prospect of a ceasefire, of a truce. Just bring us up to date on that. Yeah, so about a, a week or so ago, uh, some of the key players met in Paris and we're talking about the director of the CIA, the head of the Mossad, the intelligence agency here in uh, Israel, and the Qatari prime minister. And they thrashed out what they described as a framework for a new hostage deal. And we've been awaiting Hamas's response for, for some days now. We thought it would come a couple of days ago, and it didn't. Anyway, Hamas have apparently now delivered their response to this framework to the Qataris, one of the main mediators. Now, the Qataris have described it as positive. Um, we don't know the detail. We don't know whether Hamas has disputed a few of the technicalities within the, uh, the, the framework, within the deal. But um, by all accounts from the Qataris, it, it sounds quite good news. Joe Biden, the US president, I mean, the US have been closely involved, uh, has said tonight that, or hinted that perhaps Hamas are demanding uh, extra concessions within the deal. But I think the expectation here in Israel and in Gaza uh, and elsewhere around the region is that the sides are starting to come close to a deal. Now, whether we're talking a couple of days, whether we're talking another week or two, it's pretty hard to tell. But there is certainly a drive diplomatically, uh, but also, you know, to be honest, amongst the people of Israel to get another deal uh, with Hamas in order to get the remaining hostages out of Gaza. Ali, thank you so much for bringing us up to date uh, there on the situation from the region. Well, let's discuss all of these issues uh, further, including my interview there with uh, Tom White, UNRWA's Director of Affairs. Joining me here in the studio uh, tonight is Conservative peer Baroness Awasi and Con Coughlin, Defence and Foreign Affairs Editor at The Telegraph. Thank you so much uh, both yeah. for joining us here on the programme. Con, I'm going to come to you first. I, I just want to get your reaction to what we heard there from uh, UNRWA's Director of Affairs in Gaza, Tom White? Well, clearly, yeah, th this is a matter of great concern. I mean, th they are allegations, I think, I think, as Alice has said. The Israelis have made these allegations. Um, they are incendiary allegations that a UN body could be involved in terrorism is, is, is a, 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 a very serious allegation to bring. So, and it, it is potentially devastating for UNRWA. And as Alice has said, you know, this would have a really detrimental impact on the whole aid program for the civilians in Gaza who are suffering greatly as a result of this war. And that's what we continue to talk about, Baroness Wasi, the devastating situation in Gaza, the fact that there is a desperate need uh, for the aid convoys to get in, for UNRWA to continue its work. Um, now, of course, Tom White did say we're shocked by these allegations. We have sacked these uh, employees and we're investigating and looking into it. And it is a betrayal. Mm. Again, it is, they are allegations. Mm. I mean, I agree with Con. I think these are incredibly serious allegations. And I'm uh, really pleased that the way in which UNRWA have dealt with this has been firm and fast. I think the way in which they call the um, inquiry immediately, they reported this matter to the United Nations, they reported this matter to the, to the United States, they sacked these individuals, their contracts were cancelled, and they've brought in, I think, the former foreign minister of France to come in and oversee this inquiry. I think all of this shows that this is an organisation that is shocked and takes these allegations incredibly seriously, as they should be. But I also think it is important for us to remember that UNRWA is the main aid organisation on the ground. And at a time when we have over two million people displaced and we have hundreds of thousands of people on the brink of famine and starvation, uh, are we really going to allow two million people to suffer because of the actions of potentially 12 individuals? And I just think that it's important for us, having heard the very clear direction from the International Court of Justice, uh, which said that there has to be real progress made to ensure that humanitarian aid uh, is uh, allowed into Gaza and that Israel facilitates that and that the international community have been given a clear direction from the ICJ as to the expectations of what is required for innocent civilians in Gaza. We cannot be seen to be doing anything which makes the situation on the ground so, worse. So do you feel then that the UK government, the US and, and the countries that have halted funding should resume their funding given UNRWA has launched this 
investigation, the UN has launched an independent inquiry. I, I think let's be clear about what the United Kingdom has done. The United Kingdom has paused its funding um, till the end of this financial year. All funds that were due to UNRWA from the United Kingdom <clears> have <throat> already been paid until the end of the financial year. And new funds that are due in the new financial year, a decision will be made upon them in due course. So in terms of real funds that the United Kingdom were going to make to UNRWA, those funds are with UNRWA. And any future funds they were going to make to UNRWA may are likely or possibly likely to be paid to UNRWA. So I think to some extent, this is a bit of, bit of a political moment to kind of say, we're shocked, we're pausing, we're thinking again, we're going to allow you to do the inquiry. And I sincerely hope that funding is restored, is restored because yeah. I do not want this decision about UNRWA to be based on anything but intelligence and evidence as to the allegations against these individuals. And I hope it's not going to be a political decision, I, which gonna, is something that's been supported really by Israel for a very long time. I, I'm just going to bring in um, a, a con into this conversation. I mean, you know, there is this talk around UNRWA, the devastating situation in Gaza, now talk of a ceasefire. There's also talk around a two-state solution that we've been hearing. You've written a piece about, you know, Lord Cameron's um, sort of um, call for a recognition of the Palestinian state. Just talk us through this and, and your thoughts and views around this. Well, it has been official British government policy for coming on 100 years for there to be a two-state solution um, to this issue. Um, my problem with Lord Cameron's comments last week is I feel this is a bit premature. You know, th this war is still ongoing. There are still Israeli hostages being held by Hamas in Gaza. There's a lot of suffering going on. We don't know how this conflict's going to play out. We don't know what kind of Palestinian leadership there is going to be. So to start for, for, for what Lord Cameron is saying is that preemptively Britain will recognise a Palestinian state even before the negotiations start. And I think this is not the moment for that. I think we need to... Baroness Wasi, do you agree that this is not the moment? Um, I disagree with Con on this for, for two reasons. First of all, we cannot have a policy of a two-state solution and only recognise one. As Con has said, over 100 years we've been talking about this and if it's taken us 100 years and we still only recognise one of those states, then we are part of that problem. Um, secondly, there have been states, and indeed the UN, where Palestine has been recognised as a state. And going as far back as kind of 2011, 2012 now, and working from memory, where this was before the United Nations, at the time the Foreign Secretary was William Hague, now Lord Hague, and he said there would come a time when we would have to move towards recognition. Uh, over the last 12 years since those comments, I'm afraid no progress has been made on the establishment of a second state, so a Palestinian but state. That, that, that's a good point, but, you know... I spent a lot of time in the region and I was in Gaza um, when the first intifada started and I've seen the whole Palestinian entity unravel. What started out as, as, as a movement led by Fatah and Arafat, um, which had the support of the majority of the Palestinian people, in my view, has been hijacked by Hamas. And after what happened on October the 7th, the idea that a Palestinian state led by Hamas, gets our recognition is inconceivable. I've got about a minute, so I'm just going to let you... <laughs> well, two bits. Uh, I think a Palestinian state recognised by us does not have to be led by Hamas. Uh, but Hopefully. I think it's also but I think it's also important to say that even if we're looking back at the golden era of Arafat, we didn't recognise at that point either. And I think that where we have an Israeli government, which is currently made up of the far right, the extreme right, and the self-confessed fascist right... I think the problem isn't just about what we're seeing in the Palestinian territories and the lack of leadership. We do not have a partner for peace in this Israeli government either. Just very briefly, you also wrote a piece about three or four weeks ago, you know, stating that you believe Israel is winning. Is that where your assessment is today of, of the conflict? Well, I think in, t in the military conflict, and I'm a defence editor, so I follow the military aspects, which is not always the prettiest part of this um, issue, but in military terms, when this conflict started, Hamas had an estimated 30,000 fighters in Gaza. They've lost about 8,000 to 9,000 so far. The IDF say this. The IDF say this. I don't think Hamas is going to dispute they've taken heavy losses. 
I mean, ha Hamas doesn't care about taking losses because that's part of their mindset, whereas the Israelis have also taken some very... I mean, this has not been widely aired. The, the Israelis have suffered about 4,000 dead and injured, seriously injured. That's, that's the highest number of casualties the Israeli Defence Forces have suffered since the Yom Kippur War in 1973. This is massive for Israel. So they're suffering on both sides. But militarily, um, the, the Israelis are making progress. Can they really defeat the entire Hamas military entity in Gaza? I have my doubts. Well, we'll continue uh, this conversation uh, in a moment, uh, but thank you so much for your thoughts so far. Stay with us, because coming up, I'll be hearing from families in Syria and Turkey still desperate for help a year on from the earthquakes there. Day one of the satellite revolution. Living in Downing Street. Stabbed to death. Nah, guilty. Diana, Princess of Wales. I did not. What a sight. A wall of water. Another incident. Stricken mammal. Lehman's collapse. God bless you. Oil to gush. Freedom. London Olympic. Do you feel scared? Great again. Just bring you some breaking news. I'm Martha Kellner and I'm Sky's US correspondent based here in Los Angeles. We aim to be the best and the most trusted place for news. I'm Martin Brunt and I'm Sky's crime correspondent. We take you to the heart of the stories that shape our world. I'm Helen Ann Smith, I'm Sky's Asia correspondent and I'm based here in Beijing. We help you understand the world with us. I'm Neville Lazarus and I'm Sky's reporter based in Delhi. Always more to the news than a headline. We want to discover, to delve a little deeper, to find out what's really going on. Explanation, analysis, the people at the heart of every story. I'm Neil Patterson, and this is the Sky News Daily Podcast. Alex Crawford joining us now from Ukraine. Their personal possessions are all scattered around the place. Our economics and data editor, Ed Conway, try and make sense of uh, the big numbers for us. Things can change incredibly quickly, and that's what they have done. So, by the end, we'll hopefully all understand what's going on in the world just that little better. Available wherever you get your podcasts.
Welcome back. It's exactly one year since a huge earthquake devastated Turkey and Syria, killing 53,000 people. For those who survived, the job of rebuilding their lives remains a constant struggle. Thousands of lives change forever. Close, 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 close. Buildings crumbled as a series of earthquakes brought devastation in Turkey and Syria. Towns and cities across both countries in ruins. More than 50,000 people died in Turkey. Across the border in northern Syria, at least 6,000 were killed and many more were injured in areas already ravaged by 12 years of civil war. Many had to move into temporary camps where they've had to spend the last year haunted by the past. Abu Ali lost his two daughters, Bissan and Mayas. He visits their graves every day to read the Quran and lay down flowers. His family may never come to terms with their loss. We cannot ever forget them. We cannot forget the day of the catastrophic earthquake. Abu and his family are still afraid of buildings and live in a camp on the outskirts of the city. We're in an extremely difficult condition. Every time it rains, all our things in our tent get wet. Our lives are really difficult now and we're dying a slow death. Tariq al Sayel lost two of his children and has also been living in a tent with his wife since the tragedy. His family will soon move into an apartment north of Idlib. He's still cautious of how the structure is built. We want something that's resistant to earthquakes. That's the most important thing for me and for anyone else. To the north, in the Turkish province of Hatay, the country's worst hit, there's still frustration over the government's response. An entire year has passed and we're still on the streets. We don't have anything. Can anyone hear me, they chant, echoing the voices of those trapped and buried under the rubble a year ago. After the vigil and the chants, they toss flowers into the river to remember their loved ones. A whole year may have passed, but anger and the loss is still palpable here. All plenty more to come. I'll be asking, how do you know what's real and what's not online? And in this, the biggest election year, what impact could deep fakes have?
We're at the start of the biggest election year in history, with more than half the global population going to the polls. In such a crucial year, social media firms are taking extra steps to ensure what you see from candidates can be believed. Today, Meta said its platforms Facebook and Instagram would start labelling images created by AI. Here's our science and technology editor, Tom Clark. <laughs> Sumpai Firuzi is a gaming and fitness content creator with more than 100,000 YouTube subscribers. But in April last year, fans got in touch to tell her AI-generated pornographic images and videos of her were appearing online. So there'll be um, pictures of me holding my, my control playing games and they would have taken my top off. There's pictures of me when I'm like sprinting on the treadmill or just standing on the treadmill, they've taken my trousers off. She's in contact with platforms to remove the images but they persist, and each time, like now, she speaks out to raise awareness of the problem, more get created. They'll keep taking pictures off my Instagram, removing bits of my clothes and, and pretending that I've put this content out there. It's going to happen, and that's why it's so sad. Now, Meta has announced it will work on new technology to identify, then label, any AI-generated images across its platforms. Many deepfakes are harmless. Tom Cruise is a particular and very convincing favourite online. This is serious, breaking news. But, but not so for Taylor Swift, the most recent high-profile victim of illegal deep-faked porn images, and potentially harmful in other ways. AI generation suspected in a fake phone call of Joe Biden. We know the value of voting Democratic when our votes count. It's important that you save your vote for the November election. So will Meta's move make any difference? Think about your five- and six-year-olds who may grow up in a world where... They don't know whether the images they're seeing are real or not. And this is a really, really important intervention. Big tech isn't acting out of goodwill alone. They're feeling the pressure. Lawmakers in the US are demanding action over harmful content. The EU and the UK bringing in AI regulation. But are they moving fast and hard enough? The UK criticised for focusing too much on the existential risks of powerful AIs, ignoring more immediate problems like deepfakes. That's a bit of a, a misrepresentation. Our regulators are already looking at how they need to adapt at the moment to the technology that is already in existence. And what we're doing today is providing more support, but also enabling them to upskill as well to be able to tackle the challenges that are already here but are also on the horizon. The true test of whether AI regulations work will be whether we see less harmful fake content online or big tech brought to book if the situation doesn't improve. Tom Clark, Sky News. So, how worried should we be about so-called deep fakes? Well, have a look at these videos. Владимир Владимирович, здравствуйте. Я студент и учусь в Санкт-Петербургском государственном университете. We're developing cutting-edge technology that will allow humans to communicate directly with computers using their minds. We have uh, more people coming across our border every single day. If only president had been dealing with real internal problems and not trying to play with Putin, from whom he needs to learn how to work for national interests, then everything would have been different. Taylor Swift supporting Trump, Elon Musk selling cryptocurrency and Texas Governor Greg Abbott apparently saying Joe Biden should work with President Putin. None of them are real. But you can see how they could potentially affect voters' decisions. Now, have a look at this. There is some movement, and I don't want to... I don't want to... I'll maybe choose my words. There's some movement. There's been a response from the, uh, the, the, there's been a response from the opposition, but, um, it, it, yes, I'm sorry, from Hamas, but it seems to be uh, a little over the top. We're not sure where it is. There's a continuing negotiation right now. U.S. President Joe Biden. Well, let's go to the U.S. and speak to our correspondent, Mark Stone. Mark, uh, that, um, that uh, soundbite of uh, Joe Biden, uh, real or fake? Real. Uh, and uh, it was a couple of hours ago, and he could not remember uh, or was unable to speak uh, the name Hamas, uh, the, the 
it was quite a stark moment. Uh, and look, let, let's let's first of all um, be generous and say and remind people that Joe Biden is a man who has suffered from a stutter his whole life. Uh, he clearly was talking about a very delicate negotiation that is ongoing between Israel and Hamas. Uh, but nevertheless, it was quite clear that he could not remember uh, the word Hamas and had to be prompted uh, by a member of the, the media who was there uh, in the White House. Um, this is not the first time, uh, so many times uh, over the past few years, uh, he has stumbled on his words. And I think people, um, right or wrong, see it as more than just a problem with a stutter. Uh, it was a couple of weeks ago, uh, maybe, maybe more recently, that he mixed up um, President Macron of France uh, with um, uh, Mitterrand of France from uh, many decades ago. This is happening a lot. And I think it is, you know, it's a reflection of his age. And uh, there are so many people within America and beyond who are really concerned that this is a man who is not going to be capable of fighting uh, this uh, brutal election that is upcoming. It's worth saying, too, that, that the guy who is likely to fight uh, Donald Trump, he too uh, is elderly uh, and also seems to be mixing things up. It was only a few weeks ago uh, that he confused Nancy Pelosi uh, with uh, his potential um, the contender for the Republican Party nomination, uh, Nikki Haley. Um, so on both sides, we have elderly uh, men uh, who are the front runners to be the next president of the United States. Quite a state of affairs. Uh, indeed. And as you say, it's going to be a brutal eight or now nine months. Um, and of course, Donald Trump does have his own issues, um, you know, legal battles that he's dealing with at the moment. Yes, so many and a setback for him um, today. His lawyers have been arguing and uh, for quite some time now, uh, that he should be immune from prosecution. Uh, this is specifically related uh, to the case here in Washington, D.C., for his involvement in the January the 6th uh, protests a few years uh, ago. His lawyers arguing uh, that as a former president, he should be immune from all prosecution. And had this gone his way, potentially it could have meant that all the cases against him were thrown out. Um, as it is, uh, the three judges uh, in the appeals court here in D.C. Uh, have concluded that he is citizen Trump, not uh, President Trump. Uh, they've rejected any notion in this quite lengthy document uh, that, uh, that there is some sort of blanket uh, immunity against the prosecution, uh, against the former president. And I think the key bit here is where they say former President Trump's stance would be to collapse our system of separate powers by placing the president beyond the reach of all three branches. And so they've thrown that out. Uh, he is not immune from prosecution, but uh, he can appeal to the Supreme Court. He has Monday, uh, until Monday, to do that. He almost certainly will. But for Trump, this is all about delay. He wants to delay all these trials to beyond the election in November because he looks at the polls, and the polls suggest that the more he's in court, uh, the more his polling goes up. But they also say that a, a convicted President Trump would really impact uh, his, uh, his chances of, of winning the election. So delay for him uh, is what he wants to try and achieve. Mark, thank you so much uh, for all of that analysis and update from the United States. Now, still lots to come between now and 10 o'clock. Up next, what has the world learned from the mistakes of the past? Find out what film director Steve McQueen thinks. I've been talking to him about his documentary on the occupation of Amsterdam. Check this out. Welcome to Sky Television. February 5th, 1989, the dawn of television's new age and the most dramatic innovation in broadcasting since the launch of commercial television in Britain more than three decades ago. Galactic. <laughs> it was great, like Star Wars. <laughs> what do you think, Wilf? I, as someone, I watched quite a lot of old TV footage, and uh, this this takes a biscuit and really stands out. And I have to say, happy birthday to everyone at Sky, obviously, but in particular those that were there from the start, KU in particular, of course. And the commitment and dedication that that takes is quite impressive. So happy birthday, K. 
Ah, it wasn't just me, Alex Crawford as well, Martin Brunt too. Now I'm listing people and I'm going to get in trouble because I'm going to miss some people oh. out and that won't be very good at all. But who remembers where they were when this happened in 1997? Diana, Princess of Wales, has in fact been killed in that car accident in Paris uh, just a few hours ago. There had been extreme concern that uh, Diana was very seriously injured when she was taken from the, wreck the wreckage. There was a, a news blackout to all intents and purposes for a significant amount of time. Um, confirmation from the Interior Minister from Paris for a short time. And uh, now there is confirmation that Diana, Princess of Wales, has died. My producer was in my ear at the time and he said, just take a deep breath, look down and read what is on the wire service in front of you. And you were a little bit because we used to go to the gym together. Right. So, um, yeah, it was quite um, the shock. This is 7-7, uh, seven, seven, mm. which was the, um, the bomb. London bombers. Um, on, do you remember on the London Underground? It was actually the day after the Olympics. So London, um, their celebrations for winning the 2012 Olympics uh, was cut short um, after we saw four separate bombs. I, I of course remember that and, and I remember being at home uh, when that story unraveled and probably was watching Sky News as it happened knowing that my brother was on the tube and you're desperately trying to find out where they are. Welcome back. What can we learn from our past and why is it important we know about our sometimes uncomfortable history? Well, director Steve McQueen and his co-producer and wife Bianca Stichter attempt to answer these questions in their new documentary, Occupied City. The film takes footage from 130 locations in modern-day Amsterdam and recounts their often violent and cruel history during Nazi occupation. Have a look. From September 1944, the curfew started at 8 p.m sometimes 7 p.m. as a punishment. The Germans hung up placards stating that anybody out in the street could be shot. The attempt was to sort of illuminate the ghosts of the city, because when I first came to Amsterdam, what was interesting for me was there were two narratives going on at the same time. I thought I was actually living with ghosts and living with them at the time. Did you have moments of sort of raw emotion watching it come to, to life? Because, of course, your, your parents are very much part of the city as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my parents uh, were in Amsterdam as children um, um, during the war. Um, so you have a lot of, of um, memories there, of course. It was great to see it, uh, to see it on the screen in this way that, you know, uh, leaves a lot of room for the uh, viewer to make connections between the past and the present in a myriad of different ways. Mm. Were there things they told you growing up that perhaps made its way into the book and then the film? Absolutely, that made its way in, into the book, but not into the film, because the book is, um, has like more than 2,000 addresses, and the film uh, has 130 of those. Starting in October 1942, at least 11,000 people were deported from the station mostly to transit camp Vesterbordek in the northeast of the Netherlands. Why is it important for us to understand our history? Well, I think the evidence of things not seen, how things came about, as things, you know, you take for granted or, or things that we sort of um, have no idea where, how they emerge. I think it's important to sort of to, to follow that trail uh, back to see how things came. 
perhaps sometimes you, you speak to young people in the current generation, they don't quite fully understand or comprehend what was fought for to, mm -hmm. to achieve the sure. liberties and freedoms that we have today. Yeah, and I also do, do think it's their right that they do forget. <laughs> they, do, they can be oblivious to the past. I think it's, you know, it was fought for, for, for their freedom, so to them to do so, fine. Um, so I don't, I don't begrudge that in a way. I, I mean, then I guess when, you know, when we talk about things like Islamophobia and anti-Semitism mm. and the sorts of things that we're seeing being discussed today, you know, where people are no. saying, well, actually, we're seeing a repeat of our history in the 1930s or 1940s. Mm. How does that impact you? Well, it's kind of interesting in the sense where it, it, it seems that we don't seem to learn from the past, but, you know, what else <laughs> have we got to measure ourselves by in order to, learn, to, to, to not make the same mistakes again? But human beings. I mean, you know, unfortunately in the recent times, you know, with the, you know, with the Dutch elections, you know, the, the far right party has seems to have taken all the, well, has taken all the, all the majority of, of seats. And, they, you know, they, and this, this party preaches, um, unfortunately, sort of, you know, Islamic phobia in, in, you know, in, in how they sort of present their, and go about themselves. So there's a real kind of unfortunate, yeah, repeating of, of history right now. On the day Germany capitulated, the 4th of May, 1945, a German patrol started shooting at people celebrating out on the streets after the start of curfew at 7 p.m. We see things, the horrors of the world and the sort of devastation. And a lot of the times people say things like, well, you know, is it that much worse now? Is it, is it getting worse? And actually, is it just that we have more access to inf information? We have more access to what we're seeing through imagery and, you know, it's, a, it's at the tip of our fingertips in terms of on our phones and therefore probably not any better or worse. Well, I think, what's, I think, I think you're right to say that. Uh, I think what's, 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 what's sort of uh, problematic is the fact that with all of this information, with all this technology, People are still yeah. racist. Yeah. People are still, you know, anti-Semitic. People are still Islamophobic. You know, you know, anti-gay. And and <laughs> you know, there's all this information with all that we know. And it seems that the more we know, the less we know. Do you, given that you've made this film and you've sort of had a whole conversation around what happened to one city in one place? Do you sort of look at October Seven and everything that's happened in the Middle East and think, you know? that whole concept of never again is, is a thing that may or may not happen. Well, with these events and other events which have happened, as I, like I said, with, with what happened in the Netherlands with the, with the elections, recent elections, you could only just sigh, really. Um, and again, I don't have any answers. I think there's so much noise on this subject matter. I think, it's, I think for that noise to shut up and to sort of just to get the situation where people can actually help to solve the situation. I'm more interested in how we get there, that's all. That's what I could say. Steve, Bianca, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, for a reaction on that interview, joining me uh, is our panellists, uh, Conservative peer Baroness Wasi and Con Coughlin, uh, Defence and Foreign Affairs Editor at The Telegraph. Just uh, very briefly, if you could, just reaction to what you were hearing there about you know, understanding of our history and, and the purpose of it. Well, that's really important, and I think, I think people need to understand how important democracy is. Mm -hmm. You know, the biggest challenge we face is from autocracies, mm -hmm. stroke dictatorships, and I think... You know, th these are the challenges we need to wake up to and understand why democracy is so important and why we need to fight and, and defend it. Got about 40 seconds, Baroness. Wasson. Well, it, I've watched the trailer. It's, it's a brilliant documentary and I would encourage everybody to go out and watch it. And it's so powerfully done. And it just reminds us that often when we look back, we say, if only we knew then what we know now, we would have done things differently. And in, in this age of social media, we know a lot now of what is happening right now. So let's say what we know, let's learn from the past and let's try and create a better world from the one that is being shown in that documentary. Baroness Wasi Conkoflin, thank you both for joining us uh, tonight on the panel and the show. Well, that's all for tonight's programme. We began with the humanitarian crisis in Gaza and ended with a plea there from director Steve McQueen to learn from the mistakes of the past. Thanks again for watching. We're back tomorrow at 9pm. Next up, it's news at 10. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.